today we we're living in a in a epidemic of mental health that's that's going on mental health crisis i think a united nations number i came across said that more people are committing suicide than are dying from natural disasters and armed conflict combined yeah so you know for all of the the fear and the media and the doom and gloom and the terrorist attacks and the this and that it's really the number one danger really is your own brain your own demons your your own fracturings and and what is the worm at the core of the human condition to begin with that makes it so that we have no choice but to find the key, the keys to the kingdom somehow and turn these passing illuminations into abiding light, these altered states into altered traits? Do you think it has to do with, you know, the whole Ernest Becker psychoanalytical take on the human condition, that it is simply our awareness of being mortal beings that haunts our dreams and makes <laughs> it fundamentally intolerable, you know, that the only response to the human condition, according to Becker, is full and open psychosis. So on one yeah. literal grid level, right, we are these finite beings that age and die, but we are endowed with imaginations and cosmologies that allow us to contemplate infinity. And so there's the dissonance between what we can marvel at and what we can conceive and engender in our minds with the reality of aging and death is what makes the fundamental disquiet of the human condition, the worm at the core. So it's like, essentially, we either find a goddamn way of turning our passing illuminations into abiding light, or we kill ourselves. You know, I know you know this little quote as well. I, I think we shared it before, but these are God one. The wisdom tells me I'm nothing. Love tells me I'm everything. Mm. And between these two banks flows the river of my life. Isn't that beautiful? It Isn't sure that is. beautiful? Isn't language beautiful? Yeah. I mean, well, therein lies the problem. It's not even what that means, because of course what it means is wisdom tells me I am nothing, love tells me I am everything, and then between those two banks is my life. Like, that, yeah. that's true. But you know what's also beyond measure is, is, is the elegance of that language, the, the <laughs> poetry of that phrase, the, the fact that we can concoct something so beautiful to find respite from our ills, you know, that we, that we turn to language, that we turn to poetry, that we turn to the mythopoetic to find a, a relief from this, this burden of being able to ponder the infinite, seemingly capable of anything, but to be housed in, you know, in Becker's words, these heart pumping, breath gasping, decaying bodies. I mean, ideally, we can stitch together our peak experiences with our waking life. And we can mm -hmm. raise, we can literally, you know, kind of rate, you know, basically you're taking your peaks and you're plowing them into your valleys. Mm -hmm. And then you end up with a higher plateau. Aha! The somatic knowing mm -hmm. is, um, that, that sounds to me a little bit like felt experience. Yeah. It was a felt experience, you know, because I, I read a, a marvelous article called, um, it was on Aeon Magazine by a guy <laughs> called uh, Chris Lethaby. He's a philosopher of science or philosopher of mind out of Australia. And he talks about how psychedelics, you know, how psychedelic therapy or psychedelics work by violating our expectations of reality. So by giving us an experience that violates our default understanding of the way things are. We are mortal beings. Life is inherently meaningless. We die. But that psychedelics um, or any experience of an altered state, you know, standing on the summit of the mountain, at the summit of the, at the top of the mountain at sunrise, these kinds of experiences seem to provide us with an encounter that seems to violate that previous literal grid interpretation of what we are. It, it gives us another place to plant our feet, mm -hmm. another way of seeing things. Um, his language is that these kinds of ecstatic experiences um, provide knowledge by acquaintance versus knowledge by description. Mm -hmm. So you can take a person with de treatment resistant depression and you could tell him with words, hey, dude, you know, there's another perspective here. There's another way of seeing who and what we are, you know, another interpretive framework mm -hmm. that actually won't cause you such disquiet, you know, and you can tell him that, but he's still depressed, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's still seeing the world through those lenses of perception, that prism of expectation that is coloring his world. 
That's knowledge by description. It doesn't get through. Sure. But knowledge by acquaintance is the equivalent of picking them up and putting them physically on the sun, on the top of that mountain at sunrise. Mm -hmm. And that knowledge by acquaintance is essentially that somatic experience. It's felt in the body, right? It's an experience yeah. of what Werner Herzog might call ecstatic truth. It's what matters is according to this article, the epistemic value of those experiences. In that when you come down from the mountain, you are now more willing to serve your community. Mm -hmm. You're more inspired. Your trait openness can shift a whole level. You're no longer depressed. You know, that's why these psychedelic psychotherapies are so breathtakingly effective, seemingly, in curing people of the pathologies of mind. And, and then, you know, because life is a grind, there's, there's good chunks of it that is in that chop wood, carry water, bust ass. And it wears us down. You know, as Rocky Balboa, the great philosopher said, it'll beat you to your knees, right? So we do have to have places where we can stand tall, mm -hmm. where we can stretch our bones, where we can set down our loads, if only for a moment, and go, oh yeah, this is me at full height, full strength, mm. with vision. Mm. And, and we're resilient creatures. We are hardwired to do the right thing, the good mm. thing. We're hardwired to grow and connect and serve. It's just that the grind can beat us down. And so the ability from time to time, right, to set our burden down. An experience of like perpetual anxiety or acute anxiety, like people who suffer from panic disorder, for example, are experiencing a kind of temporal dislocation. Hmm. Temporal dislocation. So they're not, they're not being here now. In fact, what, what happened is, according to him, that an early trauma, so it's a negatively impacting somatic experience in the body is now over judging or over perceiving the present the past experience right mm -hmm. is brought to the doorstep of every moment and informing your perception of every moment it's like ptsd right mm -hmm. every moment feels dangerous even when clearly it's not but you bring that sense of danger that hyper vigilance because of that somatic past trauma to the doorstep of every moment and in turn conjure up a future that becomes identified with doom mm -hmm. and both i think depression and anxiety are both experiences where the person is not able to meet the present directly, but is negatively pre-configuring everything that's happening because of that negative somatic experience. So here's where it gets interesting. So that's trauma. And you could argue that just being born and becoming aware of mortality is an early somatic trauma. Mm -hmm. But Roland Griffiths out of Johns Hopkins University, um, he's doing the psilocybin trials to treat people with uh, the death anxiety related to cancer. He likens positively impactful mystical experience mediated by mushrooms in this case that meets all the criteria of William James the mystical experience questionnaire like the the deeper the mystical experience it ends up functioning as an inverse PTSD so also somatic but positively so yeah. and just like trauma on a somatic level ends up having all these negative consequences in your life when you go back to the day to day mm -hmm. The positive inverse PT experience, you know, seeing the light, having yeah. the encounter, the knowledge by acquaintance on the top of the mountain, ends up being a somatic experience that's positive. Yeah. So that when you come back into the valley of the everyday, as you say, you meet every day with a little more grace, a little more kindness, a little more patience, a little more empathy. And that seems to be enough to get by. Right, can we actually be awake and aware of the totality of the human experience without flinching and without contracting our aperture. It is exquisite and it is obliterating. And, and, and most folks don't, don't want to sign up for that, actually. Like, raise children. And if you do a great job, you give them a two decades of your life and they leave, if you've done it right, and don't look back. Bury your parents and find that giant wheel of the mortal coil ratcheting one step forward and you're now on the sharp end. See it all, right? I mean, like, like the human experience is irreducibly filled with grief, mm. but it can be something that we, f we experience as beautiful and profound and, our, and, and, and a privilege to be present for, or it can be that rage, rage against the dying of the light. There is a part of me that wants to or needs to believe that there is more to us imaginal shadowing of fictive characters i mean that's yeah i remember reading rich doyle's book when he was talking about dreams or in this case waking dreams like when you watch films you know it's a waking dream hmm. 
He says, dreams do not lack reality. They are real patterns of information. Yeah. So, I mean, it's still a real event. You know, I, I guess, I guess, I guess what I'm speculating about here is, is merging with a character on screen is just one example or one intimation or one invitation to consider the ways in which there is more to us than just the meat suit and the monkey mind. Yeah, well, exactly. We ourselves can become liminal beings, that experiences can happen in consciousness where time dilates, space-time gets inverted, like, that there are these domains. It doesn't have to be psychedelics. It can just be like watching a freaking film that really sucked you in. The other world is this world rightly seen, right? Because yeah. once we... Once we metabolize that fully, well, then then that default world is no longer because now we we see the North Star, right? We see yeah, the light. It, it, it is life and practice as the yoga of becoming. <sighs> Amen.